No matter how I look at it, how much research I do, I keep coming back to one guy that stands head and shoulders above all other researchers and inventors of, I don't know, for how many centuries. And that guy's name is Nikola Tesla. He says, if you want to find out the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. It's exactly, that's exactly what I've been sharing with you here. Everything in creation spins and vibrates. Everything has its own prime resonance fr frequency. Everything. And this is why once we can identify a prime resonance frequency of a bacterium or, a, or an atom or a whatever it is or a soccer field, we can then manipulate that, that, that object with its prime resonance frequency. In Christianity, it's the word. In Hinduism, it's Om. The Egyptians believed the universe was sung into creation and the original people of Australia, not the Ab original, so it's the original people of Australia believe that the world was um, created with three sacred songs. And then we have the phenomenal similarities between the six days of creation uh, in Christianity uh, and the word that created everything, the six aspects of Om and the six aspects of the all-seeing eye of Horus. And you start seeing the connections between all these ancient cultures and the creation stories. Sound is a source of all creation. Sound and resonance is responsible for everything. By now you should know that sound manifests physical form and this is the most basic example. I just cannot get enough of it. I can watch it millions of times. Every frequency has its own specific shape, a prime resonance frequency. Are you only looking at a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional effect? So the original people of Australia have a creation story that says time began when the supernatural beings awoke and broke through the surface of the earth. So imagine the surface of the earth being something like this, that metal plate being the surface of the earth and the supernatural beings broke through the surface of the earth and they created the surface of the earth with three sacred songs. This is from Hans Jenny's brilliant video, um, Cymatics. This is powder on a metal plate. It's not a liquid or a jelly, it's powder. You can see landscapes being formed here over extended periods of time. Mountains can form, valleys, volcanoes, all to do with the sound of the earth coming out of the earth. Now watch that. And then Eric Larson is the guy that created the, the cymoscope. And this is when you can suddenly see how the human voice has potential to create infinitely. That with our voice, we have the potential to create everything and anything we can imagine. That we are indeed creators. And remember, every thought you have also has a frequency and a vibration, has a resonance. Just like your voice. And some of these pictures, the images of the of this um, cymoscope images, show, give, tell us that it was these sounds, the images of the sound, that actually inspired religious symbols. That beautiful cross in a circle at the center of some of these cymatic photographs give us a very clear indication that the creators of the religious symbols knew exactly what they were talking about, that the source of, of, of creation is sound itself. And that takes us to what sound does. Sound pretty much does everything you can imagine because it's a source of creation. And, uh, and this brings us to using sound as a tool in technology. Sound creates light. It's very obvious. We know that God said, let there be light. And you can do this yourself by attaching a speaker to an LED light and see what happens. Royal Raymond Dreyf, we, you should know by now, that cured with the man that found the cure for all disease with sound and resonance. It will convert to electric impulses. And sound continues to, to amaze us. Sound can levitate. By now, you would have seen this many times. Just a very quick idea that Sound actually does levitate things, but this is not how the ancients used to levitate the very big heavy objects. This is a very different technique used here. This is just pressure waves that can levitate things, very light objects, but it does give you the ability to imagine that sound actually levitates. Sound creates hurricanes. The guys 
two guys in 2003 that lodged a patent to create hurricanes out of sound, believe it or not. And I believe they were granted their patent to create hurricanes. And maybe this is how they create the weather for us without us even realizing it. And this is where we start getting into the real understanding of some of the masters. And no matter how I look at it, how much research I do, I keep coming back to one guy that stands head and shoulders above all other researchers and inventors of, I don't know, for how many centuries. And that guy's name is Nikola Tesla. He says, if you want to find out the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency and vibration. It's exactly, that's exactly what I've been sharing with you here. Everything is sound and magneticism, and this is really important. So, <clears throat> what most people don't know is, remember, sound, God said, let there be light. So it's sound, moving sound, sound manifests toroidal fields. Those to moving toroidal fields create magnetic fields, which are toroidal fields as well, and moving magnetic fields create electricity. That's the sequence of events. But what you, this tells us that because sound creates magnetic fields, it means everything must have a magnetic uh, must be magnetic in some sort and in some sort of way and if it's not there's a very specific reason why it's not magnetic so here's an example you might not think of water as being magnetic but it is and so are graphite aluminum and glass aluminum is a good example of a paramagnet and so is oxygen which is attracted to magnets here, I have a few milliliters of liquid oxygen, which sticks to the magnet. I'll explain why later. Gadolinium oxide and cupric sulfate are good examples of paramagnetic substances. Cupric sulfate is a salt that can be picked up by a magnet. Here is a picture of, the elect of an electron. There's a picture taken about a, de uh, a decade ago. They tell us that this is a light beam or electron riding a light beam. Can you see a particle anywhere in this picture? No, there's no particle. They're resonant waves, and yet they tell us it's an electron. Can you see how we get brainwashed? So this is what Nikola Tesla has to say about the electron from an interview in 1928. On the whole subject of, of, of matter, in fact, Dr. Tesla holds the view that uh, are startlingly original. Uh, he disagrees with the concept of atomic theory of matter and does not believe in the existence of an electron as pictured by science. This is a shock to the system because we all think oh, electrons are low, oh, electrons, electrons are real. And, uh, and you start seeing an agenda being developed here, an agenda being developed by mainstream universities, the mainstream scientific fraternity, under the guidance of those that are trying to lie to us and make us believe things that are not so. Um, the Einstein, this is what Einstein has to say about the electrons. In the theoretical treatment of these electrons, we are faced with the difficulty that electrodynamic theory itself is unable to give an account of their nature. For since electrical masses constituting the electron would necessarily be scattered under the influence of their mutual repulsion unless there are forces of another kind operating between them, the nature of which has hitherto remained obscure to us. So he says he sort of, you know, he doesn't quite understand how electrons come into being. And he tells us that millions of people all over the world are being fooled by the non-existing electron. And he has a lot more to say about this. And you start seeing that scientists and inventors and researchers over the last 200 years have been vehemently opposed to this whole concept of an electron and the atomic structure that have been forced down our throats and, down all, and through all our educational institutions. That we just take for granted and we accept because we believe the guys that teach us this to be smart and they're not lying to us. We just accept the stuff. So what are the stone circles all about? By now you can see that clearly we're dealing with cymatic patterns. Very obvious we're dealing with cymatic patterns. That's what every stone circle is. It's just a representation of the sound frequency that comes out of the earth at that specific point. That's what this is all about. And some of these cymatic, like sand on a metal plate, but now these are stones, right? Some of the, some of the st uh, structures are actually very distinct magnetrons and of those flower shapes. Every time you see a flower shaped stone circle, it means they actually built an ancient giant magnetron, like 
this, magnetrons that can, that can cut metal in a split second. And I asked two magnetron scientists, how much energy would a magnetron 40 meters in diameter generate? Remember that a tiny magnetron can create so much energy in a laser beam that cuts metal in a split second. I mean, it literally just melts the metal. And, uh, and the answer was that a magnetron that size would create more energy than all the power plants on Earth together combined. We have thousands of these magnetrons in Southern Africa, thousands of them. So these guys are generating so much energy, it's insane. And we know this because we, we measured it. We measured the sound frequencies, the electromagnetic fields, the loudness and decibels. And it's just insane what's coming out of these stone circles. Adam's calendar is the most powerful of all these ancients of these stone circles. Adam's calendar is actually much, much more powerful. It's as if they all seem to be sending their frequencies to Adam's calendar. And that's like the collection point for all this, the energies created by all these millions of stone circles. That's what it seems like. So what we have at Adam's calendar is a very definite toroidal effect. And it's alive even today because we measured it. So when you look at ancient structures built out of stone, you realize that these guys knew exactly what they were doing. They understand that stone is the tool that carries with it, in it, information, storage capacity. It's an energy source. And that's why they used stone. Not because they were stupid, because they were very, very smart. We're the dumb ones, but we're catching up quite quickly. So what's very obvious now is that all these ancient structures from the pyramids, Borobudur, etc. are all ancient machines. They were giant machines built out of stone, crystalline substance for, to create or to perform specific functions. It's just the function that we haven't figured out. It's powered by the sound of the earth and activated by the movement of the sun. I mean, it's bloody brilliant. It's so simple. And now we're figuring this out and we know that the energies are still there because this is a photograph taken of the pyramids and there's still huge energy coming out of the pyramids. Even the symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge, although Stonehenge has been completely reconstructed, there's still very powerful symmetrical patterns coming out of Stonehenge that tells us that its original structure is still was very specifically created as a resonating device, an energy device. All this ancient stuff that we're dealing with, just like I said, these ancient machines are just advanced technology on a gigantic scale. These obelisks in Egypt, they ring like bells. If you listen to them, they very, very, they, they ring like bells, just like those stones in my museum. And when you go into these temples in Egypt, you know, we told that they were built for this and offering. It's all nonsense, offering and praying. It's just too many pillars, not enough space. When you look at them from this angle, you realize that this is just something very different. And all those pillars clustered together, why would they build them like that? And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized, now inspired by realizing that the stone circles were powerful energy generating devices, suddenly seeing aerial photographs of these temples in Egypt, I realized that they weren't temples, but they were actually templates. That we're actually looking at gigantic energy circuits circuit boards on a gigantic scale that we could never have imagined. It's just beyond our imagination. The scale that these guys were building things on is something way out of our perception because we just don't have enough money to do that. And macro processes, a gigantic macro, micro processes become gigantic macro processes. You know, and, and here uh, we are told that these were these were places of worship and then this is where the people lived. No, these are giant bloody macro processes and that's part of the circuit board. You know, it's what it is. And you can start seeing that the pyramids were the same thing. Giant power, powerhouses um, creating huge amounts of energy. And just, you know, you start seeing things and recognizing how all this fits into ancient history. Saksai Huaman is also just a giant circuit board. When you look at images um, from the air, you realize it's just a giant circuit board. It's not a, a fortress on top of a mountain to, to ward off marauding crowds and guys and horses and spears. No, it's a giant circuit board.